but thank you everyone for logging on. Um, we're excited for this webinar today. We are going to talk about harmful algal blooms or HABs, 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 not sure how to pronounce it, but I'm sure our experts today will let us know. Um, for some background, I'm Julia Rajeski. I'm Chattahoochee Riverkeepers Communications Manager. I'm gonna be helping out today. Um, like I said, we're really excited. Um, today we'll be hearing from both Jess and Jason with Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, Dr. Susan Wild with UGA, and Annie Couch with the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area and National Park Service. So before I hand it over to them, I did wanna let y'all know, like I said earlier, we are recording this on Zoom, but we're also live streaming on Facebook. So if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, feel free to put them in the Zoom chat or in the Facebook comments. I'll be monitoring both and I'll be happy to pass those along to our presenters and give them time to answer any questions towards the end. Um, if you are joining us on Zoom, I wanna let y'all know that if your camera is on, you are on our Facebook page. So y'all spaces are great, but I did wanna give you a heads up that if you don't want everyone seeing how you look this morning, you might wanna turn your camera off and then if we could just keep our microphones off as well, um, that will help reduce any kind of feedback. So if you have to leave for whatever reason, we are also, like I said, recording this webinar. It will be saved on our Facebook page, on our YouTube page, and I'll email it out to anybody that registered to join us on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook and you want that recording, feel free to just shoot us a message or email me. Um, I think that's it. So without, Further ado from me, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Wild with UGA. Um, Susan, maybe you can tell us a little bit about hogs, harmful algal blooms, and tell me how to pronounce that. All right. Well, I think harmful algal blooms is fine. And I guess we can call them haps also. Let's see, I need to start this now. So I have been studying, uh, my mother-in-law calls it pond scum, but uh, we can also call it blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. I'm in a meeting, please don't talk. This is the list. Please don't talk. <laughs> um, so they can photosynthesize, uh, which is why we like to call them algae and they actually look very blue-green. Uh, so that's a pretty good indicator and they survive in very extreme environments. They were there sort of at the beginning and produced a lot of the oxygen that we have on our planet. But when they get dense enough, they can really cause problems. Most of you are probably familiar with what the planktonic blooms look like, sort of scummy water at the surface or throughout the water column. And there are several um, different species that can produce some dangerous blooms under these conditions. I've also studied some toxic cyanobacteria that can grow on plants. And uh, those can also produce some toxins. The two types that we worry about the most are the liver toxins called hepatotoxins. And when the right species are dense enough, uh, they can produce enough to cause problems for pets or uh, animals that are walking in the water, drinking in the water, and uh, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be healthy for us to have as our drinking water. Um, the other major type of toxin are the neurotoxins or nerve toxins, and these can, are less frequently observed, but uh, if there's the right species and high enough densities, these can be very dangerous if animals swim or drink this water. And this has been, the cause of livestock and dog and bird deaths as well. So I got involved with this uh, group uh, after Chewy was swimming in the Chattahoochee River and experienced some signs of neurotoxin uh, poisoning. This is a different type of bloom. This is a benthic cyanotech bacteria bloom that could cause something like this where you have a neurotoxin producing species that is on the bottom of the system. And this can even happen in rivers and unfortunately can even happen in the winter. I know there's too much information on the slide, but this is something that 
California has been dealing with for a while and they have a lot of good advice for us. And in fact, they're helping us with some of these sampling devices so that we can deploy them in the Chattahoochee. We don't know that we have this problem throughout the system, but we know that there is some of this type of algae growing in uh, Gulf Sluice Lake. So this is something we want to take very seriously and see whether or not we have uh, high enough levels of the toxin that could be produced under these situations within uh, the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area so that we can keep it safe for pets and for people that are using these systems. This is a warning that the California group puts up whenever they have detected high enough toxin levels that, that it's not a safe place for um, the dogs to swim and the people should stay out of the water for a while. There are some problems um, upstream of Bull Sluice Lake and in other sections of the Chattahoochee River where some of those creeks and uh, overflows can discharge some extra nutrients and contaminants into the river. So I think the Chattahoochee River keepers have their work cut out for them to keep up with protecting this watershed that is so important to so many people. Uh, we have um, been looking at <clears throat> this section of the river from uh, satellite imagery where you can see that we sort of have a, a blue green and, and brown section of the river uh, here in where it bends back upon itself and periodically goes after a rain event gets pretty muddy looking and then we'll, um, once it stops raining, gets more concentrated, lower water levels and more green. So the convenient thing about cyanobacteria is that these pigments uh, can be seen from satellite imagery. So you can get an idea of how it changes over time. This was a recent uh, article that was published on river color and how it's changing over time. And they use this sort of brown to green change in the color shift to be able to map places that are at, of concern. And one that, that pops out on the map is this little bend that we have um, where in the Chattahoochee River where we have what's called an aseasonal pattern, which means that even in the winter, you can have uh, some blue-green showing up in, in the water uh, that's visible from the satellite imagery. So I think you're gonna hear a little bit more about the specific case with Chewy uh, from Annie. So I'll just go through some of this rather quickly, but uh, he was with his owner walking along and went swimming in the lake, became very lethargic and had to be carried out to the car and experienced um, something that could either be interpreted as maybe aspiration pneumonia or cyanotoxin um, toxication. And really the difference is that you get to this paralysis stage, unfortunately, with the cyanotoxin, anatoxin poisoning. And the, the benthic uh, region in which uh, just off of Bull Sluice tail, Trail does have these spires of anabina coming up from it and oscillatoria, um, both of which can produce that neurotoxin. Um, this is one of the undergraduates that worked with me on this project, and she has this bentho torch, which is kind of a cool instrument that allows you to place it on top of a, what's a blue-green mat on the bottom and quantify how much cyanobacteria is right there. And then she moves it over to a spot that's sandy and doesn't appear to have color and see what are the algae that are growing there. So we saw pretty um, high concentrations of the cyanobacteria when we specifically visualized it on that on those mats. So this is a section of the river that really fluctuates a lot in depth. So there are times when it's flooded all the way across and during inflow events get lots of nutrients brought in on the sediments. They settle down into this benthic area and when the water clears up enough, then that promotes these benthic cyanobacteria to start growing. And this is another location that we went to, Azalea Boat Launch, which has much sandier substrate and had lots of green filamentous algae, which 
They may look a little slimy, but they're very beneficial and not a problem, and there were no toxins detected here at all. So this is only in very specific areas, and we haven't detected high enough anatoxin to be high enough to, to actually kill a dog yet. So we are still investigating whether or not that is the ultimate cause of that death. But from just looking at this river section, I think there is there are some problems because we are getting a lot of turbid inflows when it rains really hard. And then as you go through time and get to where the time period in which Chewy went swimming, that water level is very low and the river is very green by that time. So this is a process of trying to investigate something that's sort of a new phenomenon. And, and a lot of states are trying to catch up on whether or not this is a problem in their state. This is what a clump of the detritus looks like under the microscope, regular light, but I have a fluorescence lamp that I can use that will light up anything that's a cyanobacteria within it. So they're very associated with the sediments and that gives them lots of nutrients and places to grow. I think my time is up. So I will just finish with this second um, dog incident where a North Carolina Labrador dog was swimming and in, in this case, it also followed this sort of the same pattern of having a, a big rainfall event, warmer temperatures, and then uh, enough time for the cyanobacteria to respond to that and uh, have a high enough densities to have caused problems in, that, in those samples. All right, I think I will let uh, Annie talk for a while now, and then uh, perhaps we'll have questions from all of us. I should stop yeah. sharing. <laughs> no, thank you, Susan. Yeah, we do have a question that came in on Facebook, so we'll definitely yeah. get to that towards the okay. end. Um, but great information. Yeah, Annie, if you're ready to share some details with us, that would be great. If you don't mind sharing um, your screen, maybe. Of course. Give me a second. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Oh no. Okay. Well, thank you um, so much, Dr. Wild, for giving us all that background. And as Julia mentioned, my name is Annie Couch, and I'm with the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area, which is a unit of the National Park Service. Um, and we manage a 48 mile stretch of the Chattahoochee River, which starts just below Buford Dam and then flows into the city of. Atlanta. And this section encompasses Bull Sluice Lake, uh, which is in the Roswell Sandy Springs area. And so as Dr. Wild has mentioned, you know, one of the reasons we're having this discussion today is because in January of this year, we did receive a report of a dog fatality um, after they had recreated within Bull Sluice Lake. And it was suspected that exposure to cyanotoxins may have been the cause of this fatality. The National Park Service and Chattahoochee River Keeper and UGA all take um, this type of a report extremely seriously. And that's why we've kind of come together and partnered on this um, as you know, protecting the public and river recreators, whether they have two or four legs um, is of the utmost importance. So um, again, Dr. Wild kind of hit on this a little bit, but to, to give y'all a little bit more information, you know, as a result of the suspected harmful algal bloom in January, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper um, sampled um, after the reported event. And then starting in March of this year, uh, CRK, UGA, and the park have implemented a monthly monitoring program, which has consisted of collecting water and sediment samples. Um, and these samples are screened by UGA for both cyanobacteria as well as cyanotoxins. So this is a map um, very similar to, to one Dr. Wild showed, uh, but that really gives an aerial view of the different locations in which we're collecting samples within Bull Sluice Lake. And we're, we're particularly targeting this area um, one, because of the report that we received regarding the, the dog fatality, but also within the 48 mile stretch of the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area, we feel like 
uh, this would be kind of a prime location for um, cyanobacteria. You know, we have slower moving water um, and a really high nutrient inflow. Um, so we're sampling at uh, the Gold, Gold Branch unit um, within the park, as well as Azalea Park and Overlook Park, which are really popular put-ins to access this section. So this is where people are getting in the water and could potentially be exposed. So to date in the samples that we have collected, we have found cyanotoxin producing cyanobacteria. Um, but I wanna uh, reiterate and remind everyone that you know cyanobacteria are organisms and they are naturally present in water and sediment. And also the presence of cyanobacteria does not necessarily mean that they are producing cyanotoxins. Um, so this does not necessarily indicate a human or pet health risk. Um, however, we also did find uh, the presence of cyanotoxins, um, specifically anatoxin A, um, in some of the samples that we have collected. Um, but again, that being said, uh, we've detected it at such low levels that we would not expect it to be dangerous. Um, but that's just within the samples we collected. So I, I really need to cave uh, caveat all of this by saying, you know, uh, the Riverkeeper and the park are collecting these monthly samples. Um, and UGA is processing them, but we're really only learning about what is happening within the system on that specific day. So harmful algal blooms um, can last for weeks, but they can also be really short and ephemeral and kind of pop up and dissipate pretty quickly. Um, so theoretically, we could have an episode the week before, go out and sample the week ap after and not be capturing that event. Um, so that kind of leads us into our next steps. So uh, what we're working again in partnership with Chattahoochee Riverkeeper and UGA, and I cannot stress enough the importance of this partnership, is that we are deploying samplers that can stay in the field and hopefully capture these ephemeral events as they're occurring. So these samplers will go out for week-long stretches and we'll be able to test them for the cyanotoxins. And it will give us an idea of what's happening in the water kind of in between these monthly sampling efforts. And this will, you know, hopefully give us a better idea of the true risk um, to visitors and our recreators. And if these events are occurring um, and we're just not capturing them. The other thing that we are doing is we have purchased some kits and equipment to increase our capacity locally. Um, and this will allow us to do some preliminary screening for, for toxins and be able to have a quickened response time. So theoretically, if we get a report of a suspected harmful algal bloom or a, a pet illness or a person illness, um, either the park or Chattahoochee Riverkeeper could come grab one of these kits and do an initial presence absence screen for three different types of cyanotoxin. So, you know, um, the same, we will not get the same breadth of information that we will get for the samples that we send to UGA, but this will be an initial screen and we'll be able to get it in, in the time frame of hours, whereas when we send samples off to UGA, we're getting the results really quickly, you know, within a day or two, but um, not on the same hourly scale. So um, having kind of gone over uh, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing, and where we're going into the future. I'd like to pass this on to Jess and Jason to talk with us about the bigger picture and the larger river system. Thanks, Annie. Hold on, I'm on the wrong slide here. Thank you, Annie and Susan, for talking. Um, 
I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a step out. So we've kind of spent time talking about, you know, this very specific case. Um, as Annie mentioned, you know, cyanobacteria blooms and halves can occur naturally, but there are a lot of human factors that can cause an increase in the frequency and intensity of blooms. And in particular, um, they're occurring in a lot of places. It's not just in Bull Sluice Lake. Um, you know, it's happening in other places around the state. Um, for example, there was a dog death, I think two or three years ago in Lake Alatoona that got a ton of press, which is not in the Chattahoochee watershed. Um, there have been observance of um, cyanobacteria in some of our reservoirs, for example, in the Flat Creek embayment of Lake Lanier, um, the Lake Lanier Association um, found a bloom. It was not producing high levels of toxins, but, you know, this is all a cause of, for concern. Um, so some of the things that, that cause harmful algal blooms, as Susan said, were things like night nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus that are coming from fertilizers that are coming from agricultural and from stormwater runoff. So when it rains, that water picks up all of those, those things off of the land. It gets into our rivers and streams. Um, and basically that nitrogen and phosphorus are food for the algae. So you'll see, you know, you'll see, you'll see algal blooms as a result sometimes of heavy rains. Um, increases in temperature. NOAA on their website, on their first page, they, they have climate change. The front line of, on their page about harmful algal blooms is climate, they're, they're attributing climate change and increases in temperatures um, as one of the drivers of more harmful algal blooms. Um, all over the country. And as Susan mentioned, you know, things like light, low flow and stagnant water um, also cause it. So, so in places like reservoirs, so for the Chattahoochee, you know, we have 13 in, major impoundments on the river. So that's a lot of opportunity where the water is slowed down that there are potential for harm, harmful algal blooms. And things like wind conditions. So in a lake area where you have the algae can, you know, be on the surface and kind of blow around, and it can cause issues on the um, near the banks. So, um, you know, Susan talked about this a little bit when we were talking about Chewy's symptoms. What are the health risks? So, it can cause illness via water contact, ingestion, ingestion or inhalation. Um, you know, different toxins are produced by different species of cyanobacteria. And then different toxins can cause different sy 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 symptoms. So as Susan mentioned, you know, there are some toxins that cause liver problems. There are some that cause neurological problems. Um, you know, as I don't think there have been any deaths in the US attributed um, in humans that have been attributed to cyanobacteria, blooms, but it has been a problem for animals in particular. So what can you do? Like, you know, where does this leave us, right? <laughs> um, you know, one of the top things that we always tell, as Chattahoochee River Keeper, we're always telling people when we, you know, are talking about what you can do to improve water quality is to reduce your fertilizer use. Um, you know, that, that fertilizers can, if they're applied improperly, can run off and cause um, blooms of all types of algae. Um, maintaining septic systems. Um, septic systems often can leak and um, nutrients can get into our waterways. Um, and then really maintaining buffers along waterways because you know, there's, a, there's a lot of filtration that happens when rainwater is falling on our stream buffers, when, it, when water falls onto the land and soaks in, um, those nutrients are taken up by the soils and by the plants before it reaches our rivers and streams. So it's really important to maintain buffers um, and another thing is to not never dump, you know, long clippings or any sort of um, leaves or anything like that directly into a stream or a river. Those bring in nutrients into a river or stream. So it's important to compost or bag your long clippings. Um, you know, when it comes to recreating on the river, this is a really tough one because it's hard to know, especially, especially in bull sluice. It's not this really obvious green scum that we're seeing that we saw um, it was much more you know it's on in the bottom of the the, the lake river lake um, so ideally what you want to do is you know avoid any discolored water that has a bad odor 
Um, and when you're out with your pets, make sure you bring water for them to drink. You don't want them drinking the water because that's how it enters um, into their systems. So what to do if you suspect a harmful algal bloom? Um, the first thing you can do is just call us. We maintain a hotline, Jason and I and our other staff and our field offices will respond to you usually, you know, pretty quickly. So you can report it, you can either call us or report on our um, website, that's probably the easiest way and we'll get an email immediately. Um, and we can get out and investigate. Um, you know, EPD also would like reports of this. They do not have a formal reporting system like California that, that Dr. Wild was mentioning. Um, I talked to Liz Booth um, at EPD and she said to email her because she wants to know and they would, they would investigate um, any evidence of a harmful algal bloom. And the other thing, you know, if you're recreating on a lake and you know the lake owner or manager, so this gets a little more complicated. Um, so for example, um, Bull Sluice, uh, the dam is managed by Georgia Power, so you can notify Georgia Power. Um, Lake Lanier, for example, and West Point Lake on the Chattahoochee are um, managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. You can directly call those lake managers and, and they, they would potentially respond. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, feel free, please reach out to Chattahoochee Riverkeeper on our hotline um, and we can make sure that it gets to the right place. So with that, I think, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Julia and um, we can take questions. Yeah, thank you, Jess. Um, and thank you to all our presenters. You've given us some really useful information. We've already got a couple questions that kind of relate to the data of Hobbs. Juliet on Facebook asked how long UGA has been looking at river color data. Um, and whether this was for an extended period of time or whether it was more of a result um, of the dog fatality we've mentioned, um, we've mentioned a few times. So Susan, your thoughts? Oh, you're on, there you go. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I was sharing a manuscript uh, with you from another researcher who has been looking at it much longer. I have only been involved with looking at these um, benthic cyanobacteria since this January. So I'm kind of getting up to speed and learning about these, these types of, of cyanobacteria myself. It's a little bit different than looking at it in the water column or on the plants like I had been previous. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, you know, she also asks if you know, a couple of people asked whether this data is currently publicly available or if it will be publicly available. It sounds like not currently. Um, like you said, it can, I'm sure it can be challenging to aggregate data from a couple different sources. Yeah, Jess, maybe we can find a way to at least keep it sort of a blog going about the the sampling that we're all doing together. I don't know what would be the best website maybe to host that be, perhaps yours would be the yeah, best. Yeah, we definitely have a place where we can keep that information. I mean, I think Julia, and we've been working with Julia to do periodic updates on our social media channels um, on what we're finding. You know, we haven't, you know, while we're finding the presence of these algae, yeah. the presence of them is not concerning. It's mm -hmm. the toxins that we're concerned about, and we haven't found high levels of toxins. No. Nope. So we we don't want to create alarm <laughs> in people, um, and I think that's important to reiterate. But yes, we can we can talk about how to get this data out, especially as we start collecting more. Right. It might be reassuring if we don't don't find high enough levels and and find that this was really just an unusual situation. So. Those are some great points, y'all. Um, thank you. We, Edgar, I believe, had a follow-up question for you, Dr. Wild, regarding the dog fatality that you mentioned in North Carolina. Um, I don't know if you know specifically where that occurred. Um, right, so that dog was actually swimming in Bull Sluice Lake, but was driving home to North Carolina to their vet. And she called me because she had seen the news reports and I was able to get the veterinarian that was working with Chewy to talk to her veterinarian and they were able to get him on fluids and, and he survived. He was having serious tremors and, you know, like 
in bad condition, but that, that dog survived. So I think the other important thing would be to work with veterinarians so that if they do have a dog presenting with some perhaps water related illness that, that um, the uh, veterinarians know about this, but I think maybe it's, they have some important sort of one page uh, information for veterinarians that they have developed in California as well, that might be a good model to follow. Yeah, I, I was just curious if it was actually in North Carolina because we have yeah. a couple of reported um, dog deaths uh, associated with possible halves. But yeah, there, North Carolina is doing a good job, I think, with some of the with developing more hab monitoring and reporting. Yeah, we're we're working on it, and hopefully with them. Um, you know, impressed with some of the uh, work y'all are doing there. Uh, when you talked about a, uh, a sampler, because we do find that by the time we get out there, the state gets out there, the bloom may be gone. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about a constant sampler, but that's a human being out there taking samples, not a automated system. Well, I, I really like these fat bags. Again, I wasn't familiar with them until I started working on this, but it it's a really cool little Nitex netting bag with with the resin inside that is sticky enough that it will accumulate any of the, any cyanotoxins that are present during the time period in which you have it deployed there. So if it is an intermittent event, as Annie suggested, you would at least capture it and know that it occurred. And it's a very conservative approach. So if we put out these fat bags and find extremely low levels at the end of the day, then we're going to assume that that's not going to be high enough to cause any problems. But it's a way of capturing it if it's an intermittent event that was high enough to be problematic. So right. I think it'd be a nice thing to em employ in North Carolina as well. We have, we have uh, Dr. Astrid Schnetzer from NC State has done that on High Rock Lake, which is- Oh, okay, excellent. Yeah, I know about High Rock, it's yeah. Like, it's that, uh, that dimension, the reference there to that, that particular methodology. Um, but yes, yeah, she did that and found similarly the low presence of cyanotoxins, but yes, a correlation between chlorophyll A and the cyanobacteria. But once again, very low levels of the cyanotoxin uh, that she measured for. But our state only has the capacity to measure for microcystins. That's the only lab they have certification for. So that's a bit of an issue for those of us that have other types of cyanobacteria that produce other types of cyanotoxins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Annie's going to be doing some cyanotoxin testing with the ELISA kits, as well as Jess, I think. So that would be something that you could do as well. They're a little bit pricey, but it allows you a very quick screen to see if, if you are in that system and can take the sample quickly to see if it's present. So you, can you talk a little bit more about how to do that? Or I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be. No, so there's a, there are a number of companies, but the main one right now is the Abraxas Eurofins. And we can put ordering information sent out to people after this call, but there's a couple different types. There's some that are, are really simple. They're basically like uh, a strip test. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's like a pregnancy test, but you just have to go through a couple of different additions of chemicals that are included in the kit. And then you test to see if it's present by seeing whether or not it's going to show up on your color um, test strip. And then there's a little bit more complicated uh, 96 well plate assay that you would need uh, a plate reader for. And um, that can give you more exact measure of the toxin. So we typically will do uh, the initial one just so we get a quick read and then use the plate to get more information. We'll send you those. Yeah, Edgar, I'd be happy to pass those. I'll get with Susan and make sure you guys get connected. I do want to get to a few more questions. Sure. Um, just, I think we have a few more coming in here on Zoom. One of them might be for Annie. Um, Lee here on Zoom says that they've hiked Gold Branch many times and they ask if there would be signs posted there if the algae has been spotted or if it's toxic in that area. So Annie, I'm not sure if you could speak to that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we are currently working with our Office of Public Health on a public communication plan, which includes, you know, uh, 
maybe three different signage um, options that can be deployed based off of the results that we'll get back. And it is based off of California's program um, in hopes to keep visitors informed if we were to ever get levels of concern on these uh, cyanotoxin readings. So that's a good point, Annie, just really being aware, looking out for the signs that are to come, but also just being aware of indicators that might be already present. Uh, Savannah, I think she has a question that she's posted here in the Zoom chat that I think is a really interesting one. Um, have there been any environmental conditions unique to these toxic blooms as opposed to non-toxic, so more typical cyanobacteria? Bloom. So that's that's an interesting point. I'm not sure if anyone has any thoughts on that. I think that's a pretty tough question. Uh, if we knew what what specific parameter caused toxin production for the different species, we would focus on that immediately. I spent quite a bit of time talking about sediment, which has the ability to the phosphorus tends to really bind well to it, to our clay sediments. And so I think when you have muddy inflows that are already rich in some nutrients, including some clay particles and, and silt, that that can actually be more problematic because then you're laying down some sediment that's rich in nutrients. And once it gets on the bottom of the river, it can get low in oxygen overnight and release that phosphorus. And, and that's often what this, the cyanobacteria need to produce more toxins. So as Jess was saying, warmer wa water conditions and plenty of, of phosphorus especially can promote toxin production. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because bull, bull sluices are a very old um, lake. It's, you know, it, the impoundment is Morgan Falls and I think it's been in place since, actually Jason would know specifically what the date of, of that is, but it, it's it's much older than Buford Dam or Westmore like Dam. 1904, something like yeah, that. so it's been around for a long time and it's very filled in. If you have ever been there when the water is low, you know, you can see, you know, this huge amount of sediment and actually we have a ton of pictures from our first field trip. Susan and her undergrad was out in the lake like up to their waist in mud we had to like pull them out um, so there's a ton of sediment and it's you know it's it's legacy sediment it's mm -hmm. it's been filling in for over a hundred years and, and and you know all that leg those legacy nutrients that are attached to it that's really interesting Jess I hadn't even thought about the fact that it might be legacy sediment I guess you don't really think about that it doesn't really get moved over time as much as you might think it, it would be moved naturally. Awesome. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, oh, actually, one just came in via Facebook from Catherine. Um, will CRK be able to let us know if it's blooming in the metro area? Um, Catherine, we are working on that. It's it's difficult to run those tests. I, I think we've, we've mentioned before during this, it's, it's kind of hard, but we're working to get tests processed as, as fast as we can. So more to come and on if that. If there ever was a um, problem and we detected something, we would certainly let everybody know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, important to note, yeah, yeah. that's been said before, we have not detected harmful levels of any toxins so far in our testing. And if we did, we would certainly reach out via social media on all of the platforms to notify as many people as we could. It's a great point, Jason. Yeah. So stay tuned. We'll let y'all know. We'll keep y'all um, updated with any new information. Um, with that, I think we can go ahead and close it out. If y'all didn't get your questions answered, whether you were watching on Facebook or here on Zoom, please message us, send us an email. Um, we'll be in touch after this webinar um, with some more information, some additional resources that have been talked about here today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar has also been recorded. So we'll send out the link to that as well. Um, if you're not already a member of Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, but you appreciated the content we shared here today, please feel free to join us. Um, or donate at chattahoochee.org. Every gift um, of every size really helps us 
do this kind of work and work with some of our amazing partners like Susan and Annie um, to keep this kind of work going. So um, with that, really appreciate everyone joining. Um, I think we've learned a lot of good information. So hope to be in touch with everyone soon. Thank you. Bye.